Right now, there is a gold rush for female attention online. Uh, News Corp have stepped into the market with their new service, Women. Uh, the Nine Network have stepped into it with their new service, Nine Honey. But one woman has been doing this for 100 years. Uh, this year marks the 10th anniversary of Mamma Mia, and the creator of which, Mia Friedman, joins us now. Mia, welcome to the show. I'm very old. <laughs> You're very, very old. <laughs> and very tired. You're very tired. All right, take me back to the very beginning. How did it start? Because it was in your head before you left Nine. It was. So what happened? Um, so I knew that I wanted to go, and I knew that I didn't want to go back to magazines. I was done with magazines. Why? And I- well, because I knew I've always worked in whatever medium I'm most interested in as a consumer. Mm. So I've always worked in women's media and um, I knew that I left magazines because I was interested in online TV. It was kind of a detour and I thought, you know, the job was in front of me. The money was great. I thought, why, why not give it a go? But I knew that women were moving online because I was moving online and I'm very, very mainstream in my tastes. And so I used the redundancy that I negotiated with Nine to basically start a blog. And I didn't know what I, what it was going to be, although I knew what it wasn't going to be. It wasn't going to be a blog about me. It wasn't going to be a blog just about one thing, like it sounds funny now, but back at those times in the mid 2000s, the only sites for women were very themed. So there was like parenting sites, there were fashion sites, there were gossip sites, and there were cooking sites. Now I was interested in kind of all of those things, except maybe cooking, but I was also interested in a bunch of other things Mm. and I was interested in them all at once. So to me, I wanted something that of course resembles all of our news feeds now, which Mm. is light and shade, high and low, you know, everything from politics to pelvic floors. And so that's what I created with Mamma Mia. One of the interesting things uh, I noticed as you talk about the early days of Mamma Mia is that most content makers, most people that work in the internet have a love-hate relationship with commenters. But you did something really interesting. You hired them. I did. I did. Back then it was different. Um, It was before social media had really taken off. It was back when Twitter was a nice place. Mm. (laughs) Ah, the good old days. Remember those days? I don't actually. It's like Twitter was a cesspool. Yeah. And the community side of Mamma Mia was was a huge part of it. And that's also why I was really drawn to the internet because I was so tired of of putting out stories in this broadcast way through print or through um, through TV. I wanted it to be the start of a conversation, not just a speech. So um, the comments were were crucial. And the idea that I also knew that as a woman, I wanted to be talking back to my media. So I knew that um, there were other people who felt the same way. So it was a little bit like the cheers bar where everyone knew your name. And it was, it was a really lovely time. And it was a really important time in the growth of Mamma Mia, but I had to make the painful decision to keep growing, which upset a lot of those people and um, who didn't want the little bar to become yeah. a huge pub. Um, and so, yeah, that was that was a, a part of the process of the evolution. And I guess as Mamma Mia has been indexed to women, it's had a number of different incarnations over the 10 years. So at that time, it was really, really community-based and commenters were a really central part of it. One of the things that I've noticed, because I'm really dumb and I click on everything, is there's a lot of stories about crime on Mamma Mia. It's always like something shocking and of course you hit on it because they're they're really well-written headlines. And then it's like, but that's a crime on the other side of the world that doesn't have a real like material effect to my life. I'm trying to work out how does that make the world Mm, better for women? mm. It's often a mystery to men. Um, It was certainly a mystery to my husband in the early days when I'd be getting submissions about someone's kid drowning in a backyard pool and it was the most heart-wrenching story. And I would start reading it to him and he would physically put his hands out to stop my words. And he would say, (laughs) stop, I don't want to know this. It's just upsetting me. And I would never understand that because these are the kind of stories that women share compulsively among each other. And um, I've since come to understand that it's like we're biologically programmed to consume and share this information to ensure the survival of our tribe. So that while the men were off hunting, we were sharing information like those berries, don't eat those, they'll kill you. Or that leaf, don't wipe with that, it will give you a rash. Women, when they feel a strong emotion, they're very likely to share a piece of content because we are sort of programmed to try to learn from it. So by, by sharing the story of the little baby that drowned in the pool, I will hopefully make you think about closing the fence and, you know, giving your kids swimming lessons. And I will hopefully help protect 
everyone else. It's that kind of paying it forward idea by sharing information, even if it's upsetting information. When have you betrayed your principles for clicks? Early on. Audiences will always, always push back. So early on, I had a picture that was available of Britney Spears. It wasn't a very good time in her life. She was getting out of a car and you could see her tampon string. And I knew that it was not a good thing to publish. It was an awful thing to publish, Mm. but I knew that it was going to get clicks. And it was this... At that stage, it was just me in my lounge room and I had no one to sense check this against. Mm. So I put it up and immediately I got massive pushback and I went, everyone called me out and I went, you know what, guys, I'm totally right. I'm taking that down because we've got a big team. Everyone sense checks each other. So um, I think that it's it's a big mistake to... Man, trying to manipulate your audience with clickbait, which is different to a good headline. So a good headline is not the same as What clickbait. is the difference? I've always, I'm fascinated by this. Clickbait in its explicit forms is, I just did an interview with Mark Fennell. You won't believe what he asked me. <laughs> I'm you, totally going to name that. Yeah. I'm going to name this episode that. Exactly. <laughs> and a, a good headline would be, Mark Fennell asked me some really tough questions in the interview that we did. Do you see the difference? Like one is just true and leads me to to read the story. And because we've got software that enables us to see exactly where someone stops reading, if you've done clickbait, you'll get a very high bounce rate and they will be pissed off and you will see that because they will get to the story and they'll go, oh. Yeah. And also people, and I know I do it myself, I will deliberately not give something my click if I feel like it's manipulating me. Like, guess what? Or you won't believe what happened next. All right. There is a whole half hour conversation of this with Mia that you can find on the RN Download This Show website right now. I will see you there. See ya. See ya.